in verse 10. And we have just a few scriptures tonight to go over. And before we uh, turn you loose until Sunday, Lord willing. And of course, we did want to announce and reiterate on June 8th, the, the first of uh, the second Saturday of June, June 8th, we will have uh, a trifecta of a day, a triple header. Uh, we'll be here uh, about 10 o'clock for rummage sale. Uh, also during that time, we'll have some food out there so we can have a picnic. Uh, the two churches will come together, our church and Hope Renewed, they will be there uh, so that we can get to know them, they can get to know us in a church picnic. And uh, those who are willing to volunteer to help do some cleaning that day uh, will also be engaged in that as well. And so that is Saturday, June 8th from 10 until. And if you can make it, uh, it would be a blessing if you uh, showed up, showed your face, uh, introduced yourself, got to know uh, some of the members of Hope Renew and show the love of God, uh, pick up a hot dog in your left hand and a broom in your right hand. Can we say amen? You ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Amen. We can get a lot accomplished that day. Can we say amen? Amen. We can get a lot accomplished. You can eat, you can help clean, and then you can fellowship. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 10. And if we have it, let us signify by saying amen. Amen. God bless you. I promise you if, you, if you engage and if you talk back to me tonight, this will go a whole lot faster and a whole lot easier. Amen. Good to see Mother Dolly in the house of the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand for her. Amen. Of course, she was, she's been sick with bronchitis, pneumonia, influenza, Ebola. She's had it all over the last couple of weeks. Amen. And we've been praying for her because the Lord healed her from all of it. Can we say Amen. Amen. There is no sickness that God can't heal. Praise the Lord. And Mother Darlene is a living witness because she said, there's no sickness that I have not had. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's my mama. Amen. That's my church mama. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 10. Uh, if we have it, let us read. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And of course, our subject is we are God's workmanship. And I told you on Tuesday night that God's workmanship is his produce. It is his fruit. It is his project. It is his craftsmanship. It is his handiwork. And Paul says here that that's us. We are God's workmanship. Good to see Brother Blaine in the house of the Lord tonight. Hope he's not contagious. Amen. <laughs> he's been sick too. Lord, there's a lot of sickness around here. Praise the Lord. But he's a, he is a healer, is he not? Amen. We are his workmanship. We are his handiwork. We are his craftsmanship. We, and we, we established on Tuesday night that God has been working on man for the entirety of the sixth day. We are in the sixth day of God's creative week. And of course, we know that because in the sixth day, the sixth day is in the, it was the day that God created man. The first thing that he did in the beginning of the sixth day is created man. Genesis chapter number one and verse number 24, when God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. The living creature in Hebrew, that word creature means soul or man. And that was the first thing that God created was man. That marked the beginning of the sixth day. How we know we are still in the sixth day is that he is still creating man. Every time a child is conceived, God has created man. The scripture says that he formed Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man then became a living soul. The soul was formed at the union of the body and the spirit. And so God created man in the beginning of the sixth day. He is still yet creating man uh, even right now. That lets us know that is evidence and proof positive that we are still in the sixth day. Throughout the duration of the sixth day, God would spend the entirety of this sixth day 
working on his creation. Well, why does he have to work on his creation? Well, there, there are four, I think, as I continue to get into this subject, there are four sentinel questions in terms of, uh, as it relates to God's workmanship. Question number one is what we strove to answer on Tuesday night is uh, why God needed to work on man. Question number two is what we'll uh, work on tonight. What exactly is that work? Question number three uh, is uh, what uh, purpose, what is the ultimate purpose of God? Because all of this is couched within this 10th verse. And question number four uh, is what is his specific purpose for me? All of that is within this 10th verse, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. These four questions are answered in this particular verse, but we are going to unpack it. And so on Tuesday night, we looked at uh, why God needed to work on man. And we established that as soon as God made man, that the devil then enters the picture and, uh, and deceived Eve. And of course, Adam choosing to, uh, to be with his wife he ate of the fruit and he fell. Sin then entered into the nature of man. And we read in the book of Romans where it says by one man's sin, uh, by one man's disobedience, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Uh, so then death hath passed unto all men for all men have sinned. God began working on man. He had to work on man because even though man was made upright, according to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, Man was made upright. He was made perfect, complete, and whole. But because he sinned against God, his upright condition, he had now come into a fallen condition. And ever since then, God began working on man. And he gave even uh, a glimpse of the promise that was to come when after he, uh, as he was pronouncing the curse uh, to the serpent. He, he told the serpent that the seed of the woman shall bruise your head. Uh, this was a prophecy, a glimpse of the plan that he had in coming as a man, coming through a woman as a man to bruise uh, uh, the, the head of Satan. How he would do that is that uh, he would bruise the head of Satan, not literally stepping on his head, uh, but this means that he would take, he would give man the ability to take power over the devil. Uh, and we take power over the devil by the power of the Holy Ghost. The scripture says uh, that God shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That is, after an individual has received the power of the Holy Ghost, we now have power over sin, over the works of the devil. This is one of the five purposes that Jesus came and died. One of the purposes was for, to destroy the works of the devil in our lives. And now that we have the Holy Ghost, we have power, not just to, uh, uh, just to live a holy life, of course, but we have power to, to live above and to take authority over the powers of darkness that now that I'm saved, the devil doesn't have any control over me. Now that I'm saved, he doesn't have control over my thoughts. He doesn't control my behaviors. He doesn't control what I say. As a matter of fact, now that I'm saved, I have control. Whereas before, I didn't have any control. I couldn't control, I really couldn't get a handle on my emotions. I couldn't get a handle on my thoughts. But now that I'm saved, I have literally that impetus of power that gives me control over my life. And so, uh, the, uh, the, the, why God needed to, to work, he began his work because man messed up. And ever since then, God has been working on man. And so tonight we're going to answer the question, what is the works specifically? Now I want to call your attention to Philippians chapter number 2 and verses number 12 and 13. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 and 13. What is the work? Let me give it to you like this. The, the work that he is producing or he has wrought in us is, is the work of salvation. It is more specifically sanctification. Because salvation is, was not just a one-time experience. Salvation is an ongoing process called sanctification. We were saved. 
when God filled us with the Holy Ghost, when we repented, washed our sins away through the waters of baptism, and he filled us with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. We are being saved now as we are taught and we overcome the devil, we overcome the world, we overcome our flesh. And the, the goal is to ultimately be saved from this world through the rapture of the church. So that's sanctification. That is an ongoing process. I was trying to explain that to uh, one of our chaplains who uh, was puzzled when she came around us and heard us saying, uh, she heard somebody say, I just want to be saved. And she said, well, what does that mean? Because you're already saved. And I explained to her, yes, we were saved, uh, but our initial salvation doesn't guarantee our ultimate salvation because you can lose your salvation by backsliding in the process. And so, you know, and from that, I, I start to understand that really the, um, the, the majority of the nominal Christian world believes in unconditional eternal security. They believe that once you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation and nothing could be further from the truth. They, that, that is a, a doctrine of the devil that puts no emphasis on how we live. They just place emphasis on doing good things, but not living above sin. And that is a dangerous doctrine. And so, uh, so the salvation is ongoing. And in terms of it being ongoing, that means God is, God's work is ongoing. He doesn't just work on you one time and that's it. His work on you continues day after day, church service after church service, message after message, sermon after sermon, prayer after prayer. God's work is ongoing. I'm not a finished product yet. And, and you're not either. Can we say amen? Uh, it don't make no sense that you're looking at me funny. Like, oh, you ain't finished yet. Neither are you. Amen. None of us are finished product. The scripture says, uh, let us go on to perfection. This is the pursuit. And so in the process, God is working sanctification as he's smoothing out some rough places. He's, he's, uh, he's fixing some, uh, some, some waywardness in our attitudes and our disposition. He's teaching us how to pray, teaching us how to get in touch with him, teaching us how to get our flesh under control. Uh, we are a work in progress. Can we say amen? Amen. You really, there are, there are so many characters in the Bible that you can look and see the life cycle of, of the working process of God. One of my favorite persons is Peter. Peter starts out, and say, of course this was before the day of Pentecost, but Peter starts out uh, literally walking with Jesus and says, Lord, wherever you go, I'm going. If you put it across, I'm going with you. And, and Jesus tells Peter, uh, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter uh, is the one who gets out the boat when Jesus comes walking on the water and says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. And while the rest of the disciples were looking, Peter was the one uh, to skip out of the boat. And the Bible says that he walked on water. He was the only one uh, that had this connection with Jesus that, uh, that uh, caused him to be so zealous about his master. John was a little different. John had a special relationship. John, as a matter of fact, John, uh, the apostle, uh, St. John, uh, refers to himself that disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, but, but John, in my mind, didn't have nothing on Peter because Peter allowed his faith and what he believed about his master to, to cause him to, to do some silly, crazy, out-of-the-box stuff. It, it was Peter who, when Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? And the disciples started saying, well, some say that you are Eli Elias. Some say that you are Jeremiah. Some say that you are one of the other prophets. And then Jesus says, but whom do you say that I am? And the rest of the disciples got quiet. And Peter stood up and said, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus then says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood are not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter got a revelation that could only come from God. If you read in that, uh, that text, I think it's in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew, he says, uh, uh, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And unto thee, Peter, I shall give the, uh, the keys of the kingdom. And that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is what he says to Peter. He gives Peter the keys. The keys is the preaching of the gospel. 
the keys that would open the door. He opened the door to the Jews, opened the door of salvation to the Jews on Acts, in Acts chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost. Because as the day of Pentecost was fully come and they had spoken tongues and it was noised abroad in the streets and, and the chatter was going on and men started asking questions what was going on. It was Peter who stood up and preached. And so God gave him the keys. In that same scripture, I think it's in Matthew chapter number 16, after Peter got his revelation, he then gets swiftly rebuked by Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus looks at him and says, Satan, get thee behind me. Yeah, that's some, that is uh, a, a, quite a swing from one end of the spectrum to the next. But, but I, I don't think that any other uh, apostle, any other disciple could have handled that level of rebuke from Jesus. It had to be Peter. And so we see this process, Peter's life cycle. We see Peter have this intimate connection with Jesus where he gets this revelation of who he is. And then later on, Peter is cussing folks out. He lying, you know. Uh, he's denying Jesus. And then he's crying after what he did. He tells Jesus, Lord, I'll go with you to the, to the cross. And Jesus says, you can't even hang with me while I'm walking with you. Peter then, uh, Jesus says to Peter, lovest thou me more than these three times, feed my sheep, feed, feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, you're going to die a martyr's death, Peter. Peter then looks around and says, well, what about John? Talking about me, what about John? Jesus says, well, what if I were to, that he live until I get back? What is that to you? I have a director for you that will not end, as Bishop James Johnson said, you follow me. And so Peter then takes off and gets his marching orders from Jesus and starts following him all through his death. We get a glimpse into God's working process through one of his top generals. As a matter of fact, the scripture identifies Peter as the chief apostle. And so if God had to work on the chief apostle, what about you and I? Can we say amen? Amen. amen. All right. God bless you. Philippians chapter number 2 and verses number 12 and 13. If we have it, let us read. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, uh, he, he says here, he uses an interesting uh, phrase, work out your own salvation. Living for God, walking this Christian life takes work. It takes work and it takes intention. You're not going to be able to stumble your way into the rapture. You won't be able to stumble your way into heaven. And it's not going to be, you're going to look up and be surprised that you got there. Can we say amen? It is going to be the result of daily, intentional effort, work. Somebody say work. Now, this may seem like a, a little bit of a paradox because the scripture says we are God's workmanship, but the apostle here is telling us to do some work. Because God has never really worked alone in terms of his work on man. When he gave the command in Genesis chapter number 1 verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness, that was an indication that he would not do the work alone, that he would use the church, you and I, to work on man, that he would use you to work on you, that he would use me to work on me, to assist him in the working process. And so as I'm working, God is working. And as God is working, I should be working. Well, what do we do? As God is working, some of us are not working. We are complaining. As God is working, some of us are not working. We are murmuring. You know, God is trying to work on you through a trial. And you're complaining about what's going on in the trial. God has sent some, sent some heat your way. Because you said, Lord, I want to be in the light. The scripture says walk in the light as he is in the light. You can't walk in the light without feeling the heat. Can we say amen? There's, there's, there's heat. It is, uh, these light bulbs are emitting heat. The LEDs are, are a little bit cooler. They're emitting, they're emitting heat too. 
but they're just a little bit cooler. But you can't be on the stage under the lights and not feel the heat. If you're going to walk in the light as he is in the light, you are going to have to feel the heat. Well, you might not believe it. Let me give you a scripture, another scripture. John's, the, uh, the, uh, John the Baptist said of Jesus, uh, he said, uh, he should, uh, I come preaching repentance of the light, but he that cometh after me, uh, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall preach unto you repentance uh, and um, uh, he, he's preaching unto you Holy Ghost and that with fire. Holy Ghost and that with fire. Repentance, Holy Ghost, and fire. When Jesus comes, he is bringing the fire. When Jesus comes, he's bringing the heat. Can we say amen? Uh, I, might, I might preach that. Demetrius, you can preach that. He's bringing the heat. Uh, when he comes, he's bringing the heat. What is that fire? That fire is the, tr- the, the fiery trials. And anytime you have a fire going, you're going to feel some heat. Can we say amen? And, and so, but what do we do? When, when God turns up the heat... We get to complaining when not realizing all along he's turning up the heat because he's trying to work on us. Now, how do, how do I work on myself as God is working on me? The, the, the number one way you can work on yourself as God is working on you is to fix your attitude. Some of y'all didn't like that. You, you got quiet. Oh, I don't know about that. I promise you, uh, attitude is half the battle. It is, as a matter of fact, attitude is 99% of the fight. Because if my attitude is right, if, if, I, if my attitude is right, then, then I will, uh, then I'll have the right perspective as I'm going through. And if I have the right perspective, then God will give me clarity. And if he gives me clarity, clarity is everything when you're going through a trial. Because sometimes you don't even pray that God would take the trial away. Sometimes you would pray, Lord, just give me an understanding. Just tell me why. Just give me some insight as to why I have to go through this. I already know really why, but Lord, why this? That's what we really want as we go through is clarity. And so that, can, that kind of prayer can only come out of an attitude that has been adjusted to the will of God. And so the easiest thing to do in working on yourself as God is working on you is to fix your attitude. Because then if my attitude is right, then I can start to engage in the right kinds of behaviors that will produce and bring to light the lesson that God is trying to teach me while I'm in the trial. You see, God is always trying to teach us something. He is always teaching. Uh, uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus in St. John chapter number 3 and said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him that is who God is, he is a teacher he is always trying to teach because he is working and as he is working on an ignorant creation he has to teach while he is working and so he is teaching you while he is working on you But you can't learn the lesson if you don't have the right kind of attitude. Can we say amen? I have missed many lessons in my life and have delayed many trials because I had the wrong attitude towards what God was doing. I had the wrong attitude towards people. Uh, And and some of the worst periods in my life were, were, were those times where I were blaming, when I was blaming everybody else for what was wrong with me. Those are some of the worst times in my life where I played the victim and said, if you didn't do this, I wouldn't be here. If you, you should have supported me then and I wouldn't be where I am now. Those are the worst times in my life when I didn't take ownership of what my own attitude and what God was trying to do in me and the decisions that I had made. And so attitude is, 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 it's all about attitude. You can say amen. Uh, This is why uh, Paul said, I think myself happy. I get down so low that I can't hear a song and nobody calls me. And those are the times where I just got to get my mind together. 
In, in Acts chapter number 16, the scripture says that Paul and Silas, as they were in prison, they prayed and sang, and after midnight, they prayed and sang praises unto God. And then when they prayed and sang praises, things start happening. But I want you to know that they couldn't begin to sing and couldn't begin to pray until they had fixed their attitude, until they had fixed their, their outlook. And so how you can work with God as he is working on you through the trouble that you experience, through the trials that you experience, is to fix your attitude. Lord, help me get this right. Lord, I don't know what it is that you're doing, but Lord, just give me a mind to stay faithful to church. Give me a mind to stay faithful to you. You know, it's so weird because when people go through, they run away from the church. That is the very place you were supposed to run to. You say amen. I don't know what it is about the altar. Uh, it's the presence of God. That's what it is. But it's just something about being in the house of God when you're going through. Some of my darkest moments have been right at the altar. Not to say that the altar produced my darkest moments, but my darkest moments led me to the altar. Led me to the presence of God. That's where we're supposed to be. Can we say amen? And, and so attitude is adjusting my understanding of what God is doing in me. And if my attitude is right, then I'll pray, then I'll fast, then I'll seek God as he is working on me, all right? Work out your own salvation. The scripture says with fear and trembling, this is a reverence and a respect for God because you cannot have a working salvation or a salvation that works for you in the absence of fear and reverence for God. There can be no salvation that works for you. Now, I've been saved 20, uh, 27 years, and I can testify that salvation has worked for me. I know I'm not the only one. Salvation has worked for me. I got friends that I grew up with that some are in prison and some are dead. Salvation has worked for me. God has worked for me. Uh, can we say amen? Uh, I had one young man that I was try trying to uh, help, got out of jail and brought him to church and we tried to minister to him and, and uh, get him down to the altar and he said, I want to be baptized but not right now and just, you know, God is always trying to save you from something in your future. When God and when you meet God, that means He is trying to He is standing in between you and the certain destruction that the enemy has for you in your future. And so I was trying to help the young man, and he's older than me, but trying to help him. And of course, he didn't listen, and just got word that he somebody shot him in the head. He's uh, sitting sitting in uh, uh, intensive care unit, you know, on on his way to you know, knocking on death's door, and it is an unfortunate thing. The scripture says. Why will ye die, O house of Israel? Why will ye die like this? Ezekiel chapter number 18, I believe. You don't have to die like this. This is not how God wants you to die. And so salvation will work for you if you allow it to. God never forces his hand on anybody. God never, he won't force and impose himself on you. He walks through the door that we open for him. And if the door is closed, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He is always trying to get in. And I thank God that I let him in. You ought to be glad that you let him in uh, yourself because salvation now is working for you because you have worked out your salvation. All right. Uh, in, in verse number 13. For it is God which worketh in you. You see, I told you as you are working, God is working. And as God is working, you should be working. So as you are working out your salvation, good God of mercy, I just got a revelation. As you are working out your salvation, God is working in you the power to work out your salvation. Lord, some of y'all miss it. Let, here, let's read the verse. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so I can't work out my salvation until he works in me the will and then the ability to do that will. 
it's, it's, like, it's like God telling you to bench press 300 pounds with your skinny arms and then he gives you a shot or something so that you can actually lift the weight. You know, I used to say that God never tells you to do anything that you are ill-equipped to do, but he will to show you how much you need him. I can't work out my salvation until he first works within me the ability to do it. This is why his word is so important. This, this is why Bible class and church and prayer is so important because this is how God is, is working, his, he, working his will within us. He's working his will within us and he's working within us the ability to do that will because I can't do that will, Brother Chris, on my own. I need God. And so really you could take the scripture in reverse. It is God that works within you both to will and to do of his good pleasure so that you can work out what he has worked in. You, and this is the quest of our, our Christianity and our salvation, is for us to work out or to manifest on the outside what God has done for us on the inside. Can we say amen? All right? That, that was a whole Bible class just in those two verses. Now let us go uh, to Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. Let me give you a scripture to go along with what I just said uh, so that you can understand the, uh, the profundity of what I just said. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. Create in me a clean heart. Do a work in me so that the works that are come out of me will be a reflection of the work that you have done in me. Can we say amen? God is trying to work in you. Amen. Maybe I might preach that too. God is trying to work in you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 20 and 21. God's workmanship. Somebody say God's workmanship. Amen. This is one of them Bible classes where you get going and get rolling and you just feel like you can just teach all night. I might do that to y'all one night. I might say we're going to be here till 3 o'clock in the morning. Just buckle up. Amen. Get your five-hour energy cocktail. We're going to be here in his word. I would like to do that. Would y'all stick around for that? Amen. Amen. I got three amens on that. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. If we have it, can we say amen? amen? This is a profound scripture, but we don't have time to unpack all of it. So let's just read. Now the God of peace. Hold up. Peace is so important. The Bible identifies God as a, as a God of peace. Now the God of peace, which means that peace really can only come from him. Maybe this is why the scriptures call Jesus the Prince of Peace. All right, let's read. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, let's take that verse 21 in a very minute detail. Make you perfect. The word perfect is, means complete. Now the God of peace make you complete. Now the God of peace make you complete. We read in Genesis 1 and 26 on Tuesday night, God said, let us make man after our, in our image, after our likeness. Verse 27 says, so then God created man. There's a difference between creating and making. He created us in his physical image, but he is yet making us in his spiritual image. And so the scripture says that the God of peace make you complete. He makes us complete. That is, he works on us to bring us to completion. He that began a good work in you, as Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter number one, he that hath begun a good work in you 
is able to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is the year of performance. God wants to complete some stuff in somebody that he has already began. And the scripture says, the God of peace make you perfect in every good work. He wants to make you complete in every good work or that the works that you do, the good works that you do, the holiness that you, that you produce, the righteousness that you produce, the, the sanctification, the fruits of salvation that you produce will be complete. It won't be fake. It won't be tepid. It won't be temporary. It'll be complete, genuine, authentic, and real. You won't be pretending to be saved. You won't be a Sunday only uh, uh, Walmart super center saint that I'm just on display. You won't be a Pharisee kind of saint that I look the part on the outside, but inwardly I'm a ravening wolf. God says the God of peace will make you complete in every good work. That everything that I do, that God will get the glory out of it because he has worked something in me. The God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will. We just read uh, in uh, Philippians chapter number two that it is God that worketh in you both to will and then to do. And so it, is, it takes God to work within us. First of all, he works on us until our will becomes his will or until his will becomes our will. Until it's not what I want to do, but it's what God wants me to do. It, it, I'm not who I want to be, but I am who God wants me to be. He works on us until his will becomes our will. And then he works in us the ability to do that will. Because he doesn't want you to forget that as you are working on you, you need him. That uh, Jesus said, for without me, he can do nothing. And so you can read all the self-help books that you want. Self-help books won't make you into the image of God. You can listen to all of the motivational speaking and Les Brown and Jim Rohn and, and uh, Zig Ziglar and some of my favorite mo motivational speakers and, and uh, 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 all of these guys um, and, and all of the fancy the, the books and the materials that you can read. You can do all that, but none of that will produce the righteousness of God in you. You can, you can listen to all of the, the, really, you can listen to all the preaching that you want to listen to. You can listen to all of the teaching that you want to listen to. But it will only work for you so long as you allow God to work within you so that it is less of you and more of him. For without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. Uh, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight he works in us those things that are pleasing to him and so he works out of us those things that are not pleasing to him and then he simultaneously works in us those things that are pleasing to him and God is just working and working and working and as God is working I'm working, keeping the right attitude staying faithful to church, staying faithful in my tithes and my offering loving everybody and treating people right and as I'm working and God is working and, and he's taking out the hatred and putting in love and taking out confusion and putting in peace and taking out anger and putting in joy and he is working as I am engaging him, he is engaging me and I become then the very portrait of God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. Can we say amen? Oh, I'm, I promise you this, this is better than you responded. Uh, I'm working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Somebody say God's workmanship. All right. What is the work? Let's go to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. And I told you just a few scriptures tonight, and so we're almost done. Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 19. What is the work?
What is the work that I should be doing? What should I be doing? What do I, what do I have to do? All right, let's read. Let's, let's pick it up in verse number 19. Let's just read verse number 19 down through verse number 26. All right, we have it. Can we say amen? All right, let's go. Now the works, of, wait a minute. You mean the flesh has some works too? God is working for me and I should be working for me but if I'm not careful, I can work against God because the flesh is always trying to work too. All right? So now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. We know what the works of the flesh are. They have been revealed. The works of the flesh which are, are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variation, uh, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so these are, this is not an all-encompassing list of the works of the flesh, but I want you to see these as, uh, as almost being sort of categories because every one of these sins produces something else. And as you work, work, uh, sin compounds itself. And so if God is working, the question is, what work am I doing? If, if I am engaging God in the work that he is doing, then I'm working in terms of my attitude, in terms of seeking him. If I am not engaging God, then I'm engaging myself in the works of my flesh, and the works of my flesh then will work against what God is trying to do in me. And so let's take one for example. Hatred. If God is trying to work on me and teach me love and teach me how to have the right perspective on, uh, in terms of people and teach me how to treat people right because I can't go to heaven if I don't treat people right. I can't go to heaven if I don't love people, if I don't treat people with respect and if I shut up the bowels of compassion. And so I must engage God in what he is trying to do in me Teach me how to love people. Teach me how to serve people. Teach me how to love people the way that you love them. And the works of the flesh is the direct opposite of the work of the spirit. The devil would have me hate people. Because if I hate, then I can't witness. If I hate, then I can't save somebody else. If I hate, then I become self-centered. I become lifted up in pride and pride always precedes destruction and the fall. And so the devil, really, the works of the flesh are all about me. It is all about pleasing what I want to do. Don't mess with my spirit. That's what the works of the flesh are. Let, just let me be. God doesn't want to just let you be. He, the scripture says, work out your own salvation. It working out means that I'm actually engaged. And if I'm engaged, then I can't just be. I am becoming what God wants me to become. You see, God is not content with you just being. He, always, he wants you to always be becoming more and more like him. Can we say amen? And so the works of the flesh represent everything that God is not. It represents everything that is diametrically opposed to who and what God is. And verse 22 shows us the flip side. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified. Look at that word, crucified. 
They that are Christ have crucified. Now, I don't think that the Bible writer is coincidental in terms of his use of the word crucified because it is meant to conjure up the image of what happened to Jesus. And what happened to Jesus is what should happen to us if we are going to be like Jesus. What happened to him in that he was beat mercilessly. We have to have that same tenacity in terms of crucifying the deeds of the flesh. I'm not talking about a physical beating, but we have to have that same relentless, merciless uh, attack on everything in us that is not like God. We cannot be content to just be. Can we say amen? They that are Christ have crucified the flesh, look at this, with the affections and, and lusts. With the affections and lusts. Good God of mercy. There's some affections that have to die. Can we say amen? There's some feelings that have, that have to die. There's, there's, some, there's, some, uh, there's some lusts, some desires that have to die if we are going to be like Christ. Verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit that is if we are covered by the spirit if the holy ghost if we have the holy ghost and it is covering our lives then we ought to behave if we have the holy ghost we ought to act like it verse 26 let us not be de desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another because that is a work of the flesh let's flip to the the second chapter of galatians Chapter, chapter 2 and verse number 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Are you? <laughs> Are you really? Are you crucified with Christ? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. My question is, are you? Are you really crucified with Christ? Or, or are there some things that are still alive in you? Because when Christ was crucified, Christ was dead. And we was dead, he was dead for three days. Everything about him was dead. God forsook that body and it was dead. It ceased to live. It wasn't half dead, it was dead. If we are really crucified with Christ, is everything about the old us, is it dead or is it still alive? Do I still have those ways that I used to have before, before God saved me? Can people tell a difference in my attitude and my disposition? Or am I always talking about what I used to do? Am I always talking about, uh, you know, so-and-so better watch how she talked to me? Because when I wasn't saved, I didn't take that. You know, that's you, what you're doing when you do this. You're opening the door for you to act like you used to act before God saved you. When I wasn't saved, I didn't tell you, you didn't talk to me like that when I was saved. I would have hauled up and slapped them. Or you just kind of leaving the door open for you to act like you used to act when you are constantly looking back. Some of y'all looking at me funny. Well, Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow, looking back is fit for the kid. You're not strong enough. That's what fit means. <laughs> You're not strong enough to keep moving forward so long as you keep looking back. Well, let me give you one more scripture. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. And then he went on talking about something else. Lot's wife looked back. But she was so taken with what was behind her. And she became a pillar of salt. There's no, there, there's no moving forward while you're looking back. Can we say amen? If you're going to move forward, let everything that is in you move forward. Let what is dead, what should be dead, let it stay dead. Don't go digging up. Let me say, man, you know, you're trying to dig. The scripture says the ungodly man diggeth up evil. You out there with your shovel trying to dig your old you back up. Trying to dig up old relationships. 
Dig up old attitudes. Now, if the old you is dead, let it stay dead. Stay crucified with Christ so that you can live. Can we say amen? amen. All right, let's go to uh, Colossians chapter number three and verse number five. The book of Colossians chapter three and verse number five. What is the work? This is the work. This is the work. We got a lot of work to do. If, you, if you're really honest, you, Lord, I got some work I got to do. I got to get busy working on me. You know, when you, when you, when you, when you get busy working on you, you're not really concerned about nobody else. Look, I'm going to pray for you. I'll, I'll be here. If you need me to pray, I'll pray for you right now. But I, I'm working. I got a job to do on me. You know, maybe, maybe that's, what's, that's what's wrong with a lot of people. We, we're too outward focused and not enough inward focus. I got enough, I got a job enough just, just kind of trying to keep me in line. <laughs> I got a job enough trying to, trying to make sure uh, Philip Johnson stays what Philip Johnson is supposed to be. Now, my job is to, is to teach you and help lead you and guide you. But you got to work on you. Can we say amen? I can't work on you for you. I'm trying to work on me too. I preach to you and teach you and lead you and counsel you and all this stuff that God has equipped me to, to do all of that stuff will come, that comes with the office of the pastor. But one thing I cannot do is I cannot be saved for you. You have to be saved for yourself. Work out your own salvation. All right. Colossians 3 and verse number 5. Let's read. Also, I was scared to read the first word. You, you got to speaking in tongues. You all right? Let's read. Mortify. What does the word mortify mean? It means kill. Kill it. Dead. Dead is the cemetery. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Lord have mercy. But let's jump down to verse 8. But now ye also put off some of these things. Put off all these things. And if you're going to put off all these things, it's going to take work. It's going to take work. It's going to take work. Put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, Blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Somebody say workmanship. This, this takes work to put it off and keep it off because the enemy is always trying to throw it back on you. Get mad. Pro, trying to provoke you. Do something. Hit her. Slap her. Punch her in the face. Punch him in the face. Do this. Do that. The enemy is always trying to throw back on you what you have thrown off of you. And so it takes work to keep these things off. This is, maybe this is the reason why the scripture identifies God as the God of peace. Because if God is the God of peace in your life, then all of these things that brings confusion, wrath, anger, all of these things are diametrically opposed to everything that God is. All of these things are associated with the old me. And if I have put on the new me, then it takes work to keep off the old me and his old ways. Let's jump over to uh, verse number, did we read? Yeah, we read uh, verses 12. Uh, let's jump down to verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above, this is the verse we want, and above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. This is the ultimate, this is the ultimate plan of God for us 
as we work on ourselves and as he works on us, the ultimate goal is for us to put on charity. And charity is defined in this verse as the bond of perfectness or the perfect life of Christ. Charity is a bond. Remember we read in uh, Hebrews that God would, uh, that the God of peace make you perfect in every good work. And if charity is the bond of that perfectness, you know what a bond is. A bond holds things together. A bond binds things, connects things, and keeps it together from being detached. This is the ultimate goal of God for us as we work on ourselves, as he works on us, as we are his workmanship, is to, to, for us to put on charity because it is that charity, that bond of perfectness, or that perfect life of Christ which will hold our lives together. That perfect life of Christ that would make us complete in every good work. We are, the scripture says, ye are complete in me, Jesus said. Ye are complete in me. Why am I complete in you? How am I complete in you? Because you have put on charity, the bond of perfectness or the perfect life of Christ. This is what God is trying to do. As a matter of fact, let's go to Colossians chapter, let's, uh, wait a minute. We are in chapter three. Uh, let me, let's go to, let me see here. First uh, Timothy chapter one. First Timothy chapter one. And verse number five. This will be our last scripture. As it is, 827, yes, this will be the last scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse number 5. If we have it, can we say amen? amen. All right, let's read this and then we will uh, give a sense and then close. Now the end of the commandment. Now I want you to know the end of the commandment, the 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 final product of the commandment or what the commandment is to produce, the end result of the commandment. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Uh, the end of the commandment, what the commandments of the Lord, what the word of God, the work of God is to, or what the word of God is to work within us, or what it is to produce for us, is charity, the bond of perfectness, the perfect life of Christ. So that all of those things that are attributes of God would be attributes of us. And the perfect life of Christ, the emulating the life that Jesus lived, is that which holds all of those attributes together. In other words, so long as I'm living like him, so long as I am pursuing him, then all of those things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, patience, meekness, kindness, loving one another, forbearing one another, being uh, quick to forgive, uh, slow to wrath, all of those things that are a reflection of God will be evident, manifest, active and at work in my life, and it is the life of Christ that is holding all of it together. This is what God is trying to work within us or produce within us, produce for us, charity. And it can only come out of a pure heart, out of a heart that has been cleansed, purified, washed with the washing of water by his word, drained of offenses and drained of, of imperfection and drained of those things that are not like him. It can only happen out of a pure heart how do I get my heart pure? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Solomon said, uh, well, God said through Solomon, my son, give me that heart and let, mine eyes observe, let thine eyes observe my ways. We give God our heart. We give it to him so that he can write his commandments and his laws in our heart. Because if they are there, then they are there to convict me when I'm wrong. And they are there to empower me to live right. Charity out of a pure heart, out of a pure heart, and out of a good conscience, out of a good conscience, a good moral center, that God wants to even, he wants to be our conscience. When God saves you and fills you with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost now should be your conscience. The Word of God should be your conscience. Our conscience is, a, is a, a informed by what we were taught, handed through our parents, 
education system, all of those things have informed our conscience and our conscience outside of the Holy Ghost is flawed because it has been informed by flawed men. And so now when God saves us, he wants to supplant our old conscience and gives us a new conscience, which is the voice of the Holy Ghost, the word of God, so that we then can produce charity. And it takes faith, unfeigned, that is genuine faith, sincere faith, in order to produce the charity and complete the work that God wants to, pr to, uh, to produce and complete within us. Charity marks the completion of the work of God because the scripture says now the end of the commandment is charity. This is what God wants to do within us. Can we say amen? That is the work. Someone say that is the work. That is the work. And on next Tuesday night, Lord willing, uh, we will get more into the ultimate purpose of God, which in includes holiness, making the rapture. We'll talk a little bit more about this charity, this idea of charity. This is God's workmanship. Can we say amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your attention tonight. We'll take any questions. If you have any, any questions, anything I could potentially answer for you. Amen. Any questions tonight? All right. Praise the Lord. We hope that the lesson was clear and understandable and thought-provoking. And I hope that it helped you tonight.